All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. I want to welcome everybody to our fourth webinar of our biological webinar series. Uh, just some housekeeping notes that, you know, everybody is muted. Um, if you have questions, you can type them into the question box and at the end of our presenter's uh, presentation, we'll, we'll go through those, as many of those questions as we can. Um, and so with that, and then this will also be um, recorded and put on our YouTube page for, for later viewing as well. So with that, Keith, I'll allow you to introduce, uh, I'll allow you to introduce our presenter today. All right, thanks, Dylan, I appreciate that. Uh, well, hello folks and welcome again to our webinar series. We appreciate everyone joining us. Our guest today is Mr. David Olson from California. Now, David is relatively new to kind of our network of experts that we've been working with, and he'll explain a little bit of his background, but he's certainly not new to the whole field of microbes and uh, microbial amendments for the soil. Uh, David is a sixth generation farmer from California, so they've been farming out there since 1850. Uh, so he's got a long, rich heritage of, of working the land and the soil and, and preserving that. Obviously, they've done a great job of preserving that for their generations. Uh, he was he was mentioning earlier that, that his dad actually was one of the first ones to work within uh, what would later become as IPM, the Integrated Pest Management uh, side of things. So uh, he comes from a long line of innovative farmers who have taken what they've learned and have turned that into things that other people can benefit from. Uh, so his company, Sustainable Growing Solutions, uh, produces different inputs, microbial and biological inputs, and they are one of the suppliers of some of the key ingredients that we're using through our Elevate Ag products, and uh, that is ending up on our seed as some of our seed treatments as well. So um, many of these things are coming from David's company, from David's experience, uh, and and uh, all of the things that he's learned over the years. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. He's going to be giving us a lot of information about soil biology and how the, the microbes affect all that. So David, uh, Jonathan, or Dylan and I are going to kind of hide ourselves and go ahead and share your screen and take over. Thank you very much for the introduction, Keith. Appreciate that very much. Uh, okay, and did that come across? Uh, yep, yep, there you go. We can there see it good now. Good. Well, thank you. The microbiology in uh, soils and plants is a, is a huge topic. So what I really wanted to do was focus today on the importance of the roles that microbes play in seed germination and stand establishment. So that'll be kind of the, the focus of what we'll uh, talk about. So uh, we'll talk about what, what are the differences between a healthy soil and just kind of an average production soil, and, what, and why is that a problem? Talk about, again, the functions of the microbes in seed germination and why that's important. Uh, talk about some of the different inoculation options and methods that we have for you and show you some example uh, crop programs. So a little bit of background. Um, so plants and microbes co-evolved. They have worked together in an intricate system, so their interactions are both directions and, and profound and intricate. So when we're missing our soil biology, we're really missing out on, on all the benefits of what the, the microbes do for the plant. Uh, some, something that I think that dictates some of our thought process is that when you have a, a, a plant or a seed, you have a certain inherent genetic potential uh, yield that the plant has. And really, as a, as a farmer, our job is to screw that up as little as possible. And you know, when I hear a, a grower say that they're going to make yield, it kind of makes me cringe a little bit because that implies that you, know, you can force the plant to do something that it otherwise would not have done. And that's, that's almost backwards from the appropriate, or I think the more productive relationship which is that we're, we're trying to be the stewards of the plant to make sure that it has everything that it needs in the right quantities at the right time. And if we do that, uh, uh, working with the, the biology to deliver that, uh, things growing actually gets a lot simpler and we have a lot less problems and we tend to have a lot higher yields. 
So uh, when we're working with the microbes, we build the microbe population, make sure they've got the, the building blocks to deliver to the plant, and then uh, the plant puts out exudates, which direct the biology to deliver what it needs when it needs it. So that's kind of the overarching kind of philosophy. So a lot of the problems that we see are things like over fertilization. So again, the, the mindset of I'm gonna make that plant have, have yield. If you put on too much of anything, it really gets in the way of things and it, it ends up building weaker tissues that are, are less uh, robust and more vulnerable to pests and diseases. So as, as we can back off on our fertilizer inputs and rely more on the biology to deliver what the plant's asking for, we have a lot of those problems go away. So the, the process is pretty easy. You, you build a large and diverse high functioning micro population. You make sure they have all the nutrients they need to de deliver the plant. Cut back the fertility a bit. And, and you can do that by monitoring with SAP analysis. And SAP analysis gives you kind of a pretty close to real time uh, assessment of the, the nutrient status of the plant. So it gives us a chance to course correct and so it's not like we're flying without a net as we start to uh, cut back on some of these fertilizer inputs. Uh, microbes will compensate for a lot. If there's a, say, base saturation problem with the chemistry of the soil, they can compensate for some of that, uh, deliver more balanced uh, nutrient status in the plant. Same goes for plant hormones, uh, that they will deliver plant hormones to the plant, but not more than what the plant wants. So here's just a, a quick example or illustration of how microbes deliver nutrients to the plant. So what you're looking at here on the left is the tip of a root hair. And so the blue are the cells of the uh, root and the green are microbes. And you can see that there's more microbes than there are plant cells. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the plant puts out root exudates in the form of sugars. Uh, and sugar, sugars, of course, are carbon, and that's, that's the core of the carbon cycle uh, in the soil, and carbon sequest sequestration happens through that mechanism. But as the, as the plant is feeding the microbes, it also puts signalers in, into that, which direct the microbes to deliver what it wants. So we knew that this was happening for quite some time, but only recently has science been able to explain exactly the mechanism of how this is happening. So in, in the very end of the root hair, there's, there's basically a portal and the microbes go into that tip and inside the tip of that root is a super oxidase compound, which literally melts the shell off of the outside of the microbe. The microbe goes into the cell of the root and uh, so now it's in the cytoplasm of the root and it's delivering uh, its nutrients to directly to that cell. Once that exchange has happened, and there, there probably is more going on there than we even currently under, understand, but at least we do know that this is happening. After they do that process, then they're ejected back out of the root. They reform their cells, they collect more nutrients and they, they take the ride again. So this is, this is how this is why it's important to have a great soil biology is because without it, you're, you're missing out on this. So here are the, all the functions that the microbes do for the plant. They fix nitrogen, they cycle nitrogen, and they deliver uh, nitrogen to the, to the plant in the form of amino acid, which has, is much more energy and water efficient for the plant and, and less susceptible to encouraging certain types of pests and diseases. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more later. They also solubilize phosphorus and potassium. So uh, making sure that the plant actively uh, gets delivered those more, uh, more efficiently. So there are some uh, fungi that are endophytes, that meaning that they have part of their body is inside the root, uh, but they, they will have a, a hyphae that will go out and act like a root hair, except for it's about 200 times smaller than a root hair. Uh, and the, some of those actively collect things like phosphorus and potassium. And what they're doing is they're mining uh, interstitial spaces in the soil that the root hairs can't get to. So by having this, this relationship of these microbes, uh, especially the, the fungi with the roots, you can double or triple the effective volume of soil that, that those roots are, are mining. And, and of course the microbes are translating the nutrient potential of the soil into actual nutrient availability for the plants. So they're doing things like uh, chelating cations. So all of those cations are 
uh, can be pulled out of unavailable form and put into plant available form by the microbes. Of course, microbes are also are part of the immune system of the plants, so they suppress diseases either, either through direct predation, corn suppression, which is a huge topic that I could talk about an hour on just by itself. They also compete for food and habitat. So they're a great part of the protection system of the plant. Without them, they're, they're quite vulnerable to all sorts of pests and diseases. Uh, they also increase the, the sap and sugars in the plant and make the plant less attractive to biting and sucking insects. Uh, so there's all sorts of reductions in our uh, pesticide bill as we get the uh, soil biology built up. And of course, the biology also delivers all sorts of plant growth regulators. And so if you think about all the different physiological stages that a plant goes through, through its life cycle, you know, every one of those life cycle stages where it switches from vegetative to reproductive, uh, there's a whole bunch of hormonal things happening in the plant. Well, having the biology there in the soil contributing those hormones to the plant makes the plant much, much more efficient in making all those uh, changes. So those changes make a difference in what nutrients the plant wants, what the, the ratios of those nutrients are, where they're being to, delivered to within the plant and what tissues are being built at the time. So, you know, really profound differences in what's happening with the plant and all dictated by these different types of plant growth regulators. All of this goes much, much better as these are being supplied by the biology to the plants. So let's talk about what a, a good optimal soil would look like. It should have about a billion microbes in a gram. So, you know, something <laughs> that takes up that much space has a billion microbes in it and should have up to about a thousand uh, to uh, uh, different microbe species in it. And of course, in, in the world, we don't even know how many species of microbes there are, but that it's popularly believed easily in the multiple millions of different species. So there's lots of different microbes. Uh, the problem is with production soils, many soils have a thousandth to a millionth of what a healthy population would be. They're just beat up. And, and you can imagine in any, any kind of natural system where, where things have a, a huge set of interdependencies, if you have a thousandth of what a normal population is, it's broken, it's not working anymore. So our overarching objective in, in our crop programs and in our products are to restore all of the soil biology. So we have a very broad spectrum set of biology that we bring in our products, uh, which is very different from how uh, most other biological products uh, function. So um, even, even in, a, even in a, a field that's been farmed regeneratively, a lot of the time what we find is a good uh, established bacterial population, but oftentimes very lacking still in the fungal population. And that, that's another thing that we do with our programs is to bring that, that other set of biology back that, that has so many things to contribute. So what I did is put together kind of a series of Venn diagrams here just to kind of conceptually uh, represent what a healthy soil would be like it versus uh, what, what our production soils look like in several scenarios. So if you visualize this, you know, large dark circle is the, the darker color means that there's a high population size and the larger size of the circle just means that there's more species and a higher sense of uh, diversity. So use this as kind of your frame of reference of what, what optimal would be. So in a typical production soil, instead of a billion microbes per gram, we might have a million. Uh, so that's one thousandth of that optimal soil. Uh, and instead of a thousand species, we might only have a hundred. So it's a tenth of what the species diversity would be. And, th and this is actually maybe even slightly optimistic in a lot of cases and, and pretty much assumes that we have a decent set of crop rotations and even to have uh, this kind of soil. Here's kind of a visualization of why we do crop rotations. So the larger bubble there, you see that's slightly darker. That's what the crop that's growing there now and the, and the microbes that are associated with that plant in the soil. To the left of that is a, a smaller, lighter circle of the crop of kind of the residual microbe population that's there from the, the crop uh, from two years ago. 
and then so on with the last year's crop. And of course, as we're doing a crop rotation, you want to have you want to build more biology in the soil, but those parts of the circle that are not overlapping, you, you are hoping that those, that's basically where your path, pathogens would be, right? Because you, if the pathogens are in the area uh, that those circles intersect, then you're actually carrying that pathogen around in the rotation. And of course, it's one of the reasons why we do rotations is to not have that happen. So I thought that was a little interesting to, to throw in there just as a visualization of how the soil biology reacts to the concept of crop rotation. Now, we look at a lot of, of uh, soils that have either effective monocultures or uh, are GMO-based uh, genetics uh, for the plants. And we find that we have even a much more severely affected biology. So now the, the circle is much smaller because we have less species and it's less, it's less dark colored because there's much smaller population. So we have a millionth the size of an optimal soil uh, in terms of population and a 20th of the size of population diversity. So at this point, you know, you're, you're treating your soil like it's, it's basically a sponge to put stuff in for the plant to pick up and it's just physically to hold up the plant from falling over because it's effectively a, a dead soil that's not really doing any uh, beneficial functions for your plants. Now, the idea of having a cover crop is, you know, here we have different species or hopefully even different genus of cover crops and different microbes that associate with each one of those different species. So now by having a diversity of, of plants to colonize and, and have complementary soil biology with, now we have 10 million uh, microbes per gram of soil, which is only a hundredth of what the optimal soil is, but it's certainly way better than the other, other options. And now we have a hundred species of, of uh, different microbes. So you can see again, the, the more different or, you know, the more diversity there is say in the genus of your cover crops, probably the less overlap you're gonna have in these circles. And so the more, more effective building of the soil biology and function you're going to get out of that. Now here's, here's kind of a conceptual representation of those same uh, cover crops, but now inoculated. So we have some uh, seed inoculant treatments that we have that have hundreds of different species of microbes. So you see that each one of those circles got bigger because they have more species that now have colonized them. They're also darker because we now have higher populations of those. And then you have kind of this over uh, background uh, circle, which we've kind of built more biology that's just inherently in the soil and not necessarily uh, associated with, with the plants themselves. But now we've got a 10th of what uh, an optimal population would be rather than a hundredth. Uh, and so we've got a much better situation. So uh, this is what we're after here. So as you get your, your cash crop and you interlace this with the biology that's been built by the cover crop and the inoculated seeds, uh, this is what we're trying to accomplish. So uh, here are all the different opportunities to kind of work biology into your production program. And not all of these are for everyone, uh, but you kind of look, pick on the ones that work the best for your operations. So we can inoculate the, the soil at bed prep. So if you're listing up you know, and doing any pre-plant fertilizers, that's an opportunity to get biology going in the soil. The more time you give biology to do its job for the plants, the more effective it is. Uh, so we're gonna spend a lot of our time talking about the seed inoculation uh, part of it here. So I won't go into more, but again, the more time the biology has to work on uh, for the crop, the better. So seed inoculation being that first opportunity. So it's, it's a critical one, makes a big difference. And then we have transplant drenches and uh, over the seed line. Uh, between seed inoculation and planting over the seed line, probably the best value in terms of bang for the buck uh, in getting a lot of value out of the, the micro materials you're putting on uh, and the response that you'll get out of, out of the crop from it. And we have various other opportunities like side dressing or top dressing, uh, irrigation applied, foliar, and also uh, 
crop decomposition, which is also another excellent one for uh, bang for your buck. Does a ton of stuff for you, but we probably won't go into any detail on that uh, today. So uh, microbes do a ton of stuff for the seed germination and stand establishment. And the, uh, interestingly, the first relationship uh, between the microbes and the seeds are the fact that the seeds actually have a lot of microbes in them. Uh, some recent university uh, research has indicated that as many as 2,000 different microbe species have been discovered and documented inside seeds. So if you want to have a strong plant, it really needs to come from uh, strong seeds. And strong seeds come from plants that are vigorous and uh, have a healthy microbiome associated with them. So when you see seeds that have microbiology in them, that, that actually occurs during the pollinization process. So you want to have a good healthy biology in, in the canopy of the parent plant as they're setting those seeds so that you have seeds that have good biology in them to start with. So when, when we get to the germination process, here's, here's what's going on. So when, when the seeds first starts to hydrate, one of the things it does is it puts out an exudate uh, through the, the skin of the, the seed, and it signals the microbes to come colonize it. And so it's, it's literally an in invitation. It's putting out food for them to come uh, participate. So when they do, the microbes come and they provide a lot of different metabolites and enzymes. So the first thing they do is they provide some enzymes that soften the seed coat, which allows moisture to get into the seed more efficiently. They provide amylase enzyme, which converts the endosperm of the seed into uh, the, endo the starch and the endosperm into sugars. And it uses that energy for the seed to germinate and grow. Then there's a bunch of hormone things that are happening. Um, some of the microbes do produce these hormones and those hormones are used by the, the seed in, in the germination process. Now this, this is very complex and I'm very greatly simplifying and generalizing about this, but jasmonic acid actually helps the seed come out of, of dormancy. It's the signaler to start the germination process. It does that in, in collaboration or in conjunction with also gibberellic acid. Um, and uh, oh, the jasmonic acid also is responsible for the primary root initiation. So super, super important because that's basically initiating a taproot. Uh, Indolacidic acid does cell division. So again, that's the spark of, <laughs> of, the, of the seed to build it, uh, it, itself into a plant. Uh, Gibrelic acid is re responsible for cell elongation. So if you think about that cotyledon, uh, and its strength of pushing through the crust in the soil, gibberellic acid gives it a lot more strength to push through a crust. So you see a much stronger, uh, faster emergence because of that. The microbes, of course, are also feeding the seed already. Uh, the amino acids that I talked about, the phosphorus and the cations. They're also feeding other uh, root-related uh, and growth-related hormones like auxins and cytokinins. And the, as I mentioned, the endophytic uh, fungi, the ones that partially live inside the root, uh, are uh, colonizing the roots at that point, and they're extending the root zone more quickly. So if you think about your fertilizer placement relative to your seed location, the endophyte fungi are going to help that plant get access to that nutrient set much more quickly. So, so what, what happens when we have that level of micro participation in seed germination? Well, we have an increased percent of, of seeds that actually germinate. There are quite a number of studies that have been done on that. We get a faster and more uniform uh, germination, so we have less lag. I'll talk about why that's important in a minute. Um, we get a better stand establishment, more uniform. We get a stronger push through the crust, so we have less uh, emergence failure. Uh, we have less mortality due to damping off and other uh, types of diseases. You get larger root systems faster, which mine nutrients more effectively, uh, efficiently, as well as water. So it makes our, our seedlings say uh, less drought prone. One thing that happens here to us in some of our field crops here is we'll, we'll have the appropriate moisture in the soil for planting and then we'll get a very, very dry north wind and all of a sudden it'll pull the moisture out of the first couple or three inches of soil. 
Uh, so in some cases that can really, really uh, set back a crop. But if we've got a, a stand that is, has more deeply rooted itself faster, it's much less vulnerable to that. I'm sure many of you have similar types of challenges. So of course, with all the above, you get a higher stand population, you get better nutrient status, and you get a more vigorous plant. So when we're talking about uh, lag and, and emergence, and, and this, there's quite a bit of variability from crop to crop. And so again, this is pretty highly generalized, but we did some uh, corn emergence studies a couple of years ago, where we're looking at the time lag between the first seed that emerges and how many of those emerge within the first 24 hours of that happening. And then how many uh, emergences happen the second 24 hours and the third 24 hours. And what we saw was 17% uh, more seeds or more plants germinated in that first 24 hour set and less than the second 24 hour and, and, and much less in the third 24 hour set. So we're kind of moving everything forward to much more uniform. Well, and again, it varies from crop to crop, but, um, and, and there's, a lot of different research on this, but a five to 10% incremental loss in yield for every 24 hours and delay for emergence. So uh, right there, remember what I said is a plant has a certain amount of genetic potential for yield. Our job is to screw that up as little as possible. So if we have made the emergence much more uniform, we've already screwed up less. So, and, uh, and things happen really fast with a crop. Uh, a lot of the principal things that define what your yields are going to be happen very, very early in the season. So if, if we have you know, inefficiencies or imperfections in what the status or condition of the plant is, we really get dinged for it hard uh, out of the gate. So we talked a lot about it, uh, inoculation. So we have several different options for uh, doing seed inoculations. Again, pick the one that, that works the best for you. We have a dry inoculant powder called uh, foundational fungi. And it's really neat, neat product because it is truly fungal dominant and it comes from a, a different uh, set of biology than pretty much any other product that we know of. So it's very complementary to some of our other products and it does bring that fungal component which is missing from even some of the best gen regenerative soils that we've seen. Again, uh, seed inoculation is probably one of your best bangs for your buck that you can get because you use so little material. And because it gets to participate in that germination process, it has so much more opportunity to beneficially affect the outcome of the crop. So we're only using two to four ounces of this product per hundred weight of seed. There's any number of opportunities you can put it on. You can put it on during handling or bagging or, or even just pour it over the hopper in the, on the planter. So typically you might be looking at anywhere from two to $8 per acre for something like that, for either, either one of these uh, options for the inoculation. So if the powder's not right for you, we also have liquid inoculants. Uh, so these are again, very high populations, very diverse biology. So the Metagro F is actually the liquid version of the powdered foundational fungi. So same biology, uh, just in a liquid form. And then we have the Metagro 5X Plus, which is our, con our concentrate biology. It's a different set of biology than either the Metagro F or some of our other products. But of course, then, then we've got some options for how we apply liquid products there. So we've done a number of studies about what the biology does. Well, we're actually trying to reestablish the biology of the soil. So we, we go from a, a very impaired production soil, and then we do some inoculants uh, on it. So in this case, this is a study where we looked at the base condition of the soil and its beneficial functions that the microbes are supposed to do for the plant. And then we, we did it one treatment of our biology. And then we came back and said, okay, how much have we actually improved the function of the soil? Because we wanted to quantify that. So we had a 190% increase in nitrogen fixing, 420% increase in phosphate solubilizing. So really, really making some big differences there. Double the species diversity. 73% uh, colonization rate. So of all the different biology that we have identified in our product, 73% of that we actually were able to find in the soil afterwards. Uh, the cation uh, chelation I've talked about, so a 270% increase in that function uh, in the soil, 190% uh, increase in the plant growth regulators, a 500 time increase in the systemic acquired resistance or the induced systemic re resistance. 
functions of the biology. So in this soil, that function was nearly absent. And here, here we brought it back to, I think, a very highly functioning level. Uh, so what it does is, of course, makes your plant much more uh, resilient to pests, diseases, uh, toxins, uh, stress, you know, heat or cold stress or drought. So and then a 540 time increase in chemical residue degraders, so breaking down all those old uh, chemical materials in the soil. 140 time increase in uh, organic matter decomposers. So naturally we're having our crop residue break down much more quickly. A 93% reduction in plant pathogens. So in this case, Fusarium was the dominant uh, fungal pathogen. And in the subsequent testing, it was uh, almost a non-detect. Uh, and then a 99% uh, reduction in anaerobic microbes. So my apologies for making this slide sideways. Everybody tilt your, tilt your head to the left a little. Uh, and so you, you heard me just discuss at length the, the fact that we can actually restore the function of the biology uh, in the soil. But the critical thing is, is like, what does that actually translate in terms of plants? How do they respond to it? Well, this is a sap analysis from a couple of years ago with, with New Age Labs. And what we did is we had the treated, uh, the grower standard program, and then we had our biological program. And in the biological program, we cut the nitrogen back by 20%, or excuse me, 50%. So way, way less, less nitrogen. So we're, we're testing a lot of things here. It's like, okay, so everything else is the same except for nitrogen. What was the nutrient status of the plant? How, how much additional nutrient were we able to get into that plant because of the function of the biology we've, we've established here. So at the bottom of the page here uh, is three bars or three sets of bars that look at nitrogen. So uh, the middle one is total nitrogen. And so that's gonna represent uh, amino acid form of nitrogen, predominantly in this case. And so even though we put on 50% less nitrogen in the program, we had 20% higher total nitrogen status in the plant, which is excellent. That means that not only we save all that money on the fertilizer, which was more than enough to pay for the biological program, but we have a healthier plant uh, and a higher protein content plant. And uh, the, other, the other part that's good about the nitrogen set here is we had a substantial reduction in the nitrate uh, concentration in the uh, form of nitrogen in the plant. So a 56% reduction there. And that means that with less nitrate concentration, there's a bunch of biting and sucking type insects that will be much, much, much less interested in, in feeding on this plant. Uh, and then the ammonium form uh, has almost disappeared uh, of nitrogen. And ammonium forms in a plant when a plant is under stress. So you know how we say that mites like stressed plants. Well, the reason why mites like stressed plants is because they have higher ammonium in them. In them. By nearly eliminating the ammonium form of nitrogen in this plant, that means that mites are not going to be interested in this plant at all. Then looking at the very top set of bars is our total sugars. So we've increased that by 272%. So the sugars are the carbohydrates that are formed by the plant uh, from photosynthesis. So we've increased the photosynthetic efficiency of the plant, but it also means that we're building and storing more energy in that plant in the form of those sugars. Uh, those sugars being in the sap also is a deterrent for uh, insects and insect pests because insects don't have a pancreas, they can't process sugar. So as you get those sugars up in the sap, again, much, much less interest from pests in, in bothering that plant. Then pretty much across the board, you can see for all of our principal nutrients here, we have moved the needle a lot. Uh, a 29% increase in phosphorus. You know, I, I have a lot of growers that complain to us, and it kind of draws a lot of people into a biological program with us, that every year they take tissue samples on their crops and they see that the, the phosphorus is not the target levels that they want. And every year they, they look at their soils and they have tons of phosphorus in the soil. And the PCA comes back every year and tells them to put on more phosphorus. And they, they know that that's not, that's not the solution because that's what they did last year. 
So by having the biology there, we're actually getting the biology to get the, the nutrient potential of the soil successfully into the plant. And so we're seeing that across the board here in, in all these sap analysis. But again, if we saw something that was lagging uh, in nutrient status, especially as it comes up on a, an important plant growth stage, which relies upon that nutrient, this, this tool gives us the opportunity to intervene and put on a foliar and address that uh, lagging the, the nutrient content. So uh, what makes our biological products a little different than everybody else? So most other biological products just have a handful of, of uh, microbes in it. So if you remember those Venn diagrams that I was pointing to earlier, if, if you have, say, a product that has a half dozen species in it, it's not going to change those diagrams at all. So uh, an acid inoculant that has a half dozen species might give you some of those functions, but it's not going to rebuild your soil or re rebuild the function of your soil. So our approach is to have a very large and very diverse set of biology. So we have up to 20,000 different species and 100 billion microbes per milliliter. So that means for every drop of our product, you have 5 billion microbes in it. So very, very different. Uh, and our objective is to restore all of the soil biology, not just a, just a handful of species. And for every one of those plant beneficial functions that I, I listed before, I don't want to just have one microbe that does it. I, I want dozens of them to do it. Uh, our products are shelf stable, which means that you can store them for years and you can also mix them with uh, synthetic fertilizers with no or very little uh, mortality. And there, our other approach is, that I think is different is that we take, uh, we look at the, the entire crop uh, cycle and all the different growth stages. And instead of just focusing on our own products, we, we integrate our products with some other, other products to build a, a comprehensive crop program. Because again, we're trying to get the biology there and functioning and then delivering what the plant needs at the time. So here's, here's just an example of what a, a crop program looks like. And again, not every opportunity fits in every operation. So these are all op optional. Uh, obviously, they work better together. Uh, the more of them you can do, the, the more benefit you get. Some, some give you a much better response than others. Uh, some of them respond better if they're in combination. So we already talked about the seed treatment. In this case, I'm talking about the powdered uh, foundational fungi. We already talked about what the benefits are of that. Uh, we also apply biology in, at planting, so directly over the seed line. In this case, I'm talking about a Metagro 5X concentrate uh, combined with a microbe food product. This is a wettable powder, and then a fish hydrolysate that has a lot of uh, clean phosphorus in it. Uh, you can do either one or the other of these. However, I think that together they do much better because it's actually a different and complementary set of biology. You can really only get so much material onto your seed coat uh, by having reinforcing that biology with, uh, from the seed coat with uh, an at planting uh, application is probably about the strongest program you, you can do. And it's very complementary and makes both of them work better. Uh, so if you only had a chance to do two, those are the two I would choose. Uh, you can also do things like side dress. So you can either do a wide drop or uh, side dress, uh, top dress, just depends on the type of crop and what your, your conditions are. Usually we try to time this for, uh, you know, early, early stand establishment. And then we have a second application like that. We could either do it foliar uh, or uh, again, irrigation or side drop. <clears throat> and again, uh, the same sorts of benefits you can read for yourself. And then another uh, option within a crop program can be the crop residue decomposition. So we have a set of biology that's specially designed for breaking down uh, lignans and cellulose. Uh, that's Metagro Decomp. And then some food uh, to build that biology and make those work better. So I hope that was informative, and I guess we have some time for some questions. And I've, I've, uh, we, as Keith mentioned at the beginning, we do work very closely with and in, in conjunction with Elevate Ag. And so uh, certainly I would consider them a resource for uh, supporting you and how to use these products 
uh, and strategies most beneficially in accessing product. Well, thank you very much, David. That was very, very informative. Um, I think maybe uh, to start off uh, with a question, um, you know, about reducing fertilizer, how much, you know, at first and maybe how fast can, can a grower start reducing these, these fertilizer rates by using biological products? Yeah, it depends. I think uh, a lot on the set of circumstances. So uh, if you have a really, really impaired soil, I would probably start trying to build biology for a season before I started to try to cut things back. Uh, if I felt like I had pretty good traction and a good foundation to build from, you can start doing that the first year. However, I would recommend a pretty frequent SAP analysis monitoring just to make sure that we stay on track. That's our safety net when, when we, we're doing things like that. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, so kind of off to the next question, Sean here is asking uh, about the uh, GMO crops and why they, why they uh, degrade the soil. And is this still true if in a, in a biological farming system? So if the uh, growers using GMO crops, but kind of using biologicals, is that still, still playing or still being true in that scenario? Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't put myself uh, forward as an authority on that. Uh, there's, there's some very interesting research. It looks like and that, that's kind of as firmly as I'll say it, that the exudates that the roots are putting out uh, from a GMO crop are more selective for the biology that they will associate with, and, and they may actively suppress certain parts of the biology as well. So we just tend to see a reduced set of biology associated with those GMO crops. And, and of course, if, if you are... Uh, say cover cropping with that, I would think that that will go a long ways in reducing uh, or at least somewhat mitigating that tendency. Okay. So in the test that you uh, presented, was that with a GMO crop or a non-GMO crop? Uh, the soil restoration study? Yeah. Yeah, that was a non-GMO crop. Okay. okay. Uh, got a question here from uh, Tom uh, asking to explain the SAP analysis and what and how to maybe take it and uh, maybe where you would recommend sending it to? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so we typically, the, the sample that I showed you or the test result was from New Age Labs. They're up in Michigan and that's who we typically use. Uh, it's an easy to read report, the support's excellent. Uh, their results have been very consistent. I've, I've, there's a couple other labs that do it. And uh, I think, New Age gives you probably a better quality nitrogen number than, than one of the others. And again, the, the support on, on the test results is quite good. And actually, you should probably even do maybe a, a one of these sessions on SAP analysis would be, would be my recommendation. Um, it costs anywhere from uh, 80 to, to 50 bucks, depending on if you just do a, simple, a single sample versus by a season long package. And what it's doing is it's actually measuring the nutrient content of the sap that's flowing around in, in the, the plant. So if you compare that to say a tissue analysis, tissue analysis tells you more about what the nutrient status was of the plant as those tissues were being built. The sap tells you what's flowing around right now in the plant. So it's almost like the difference between, you know, the sap analysis is kind of like a blood test. Uh, and the, the analogy that I make between the two is this, the tissue analysis is like trying to drive your car by only looking in the rear view mirror uh, versus a SAP analysis, at least you can see the front bumper. So, uh, you know, instead of being reactive, we can be a little bit more proactive with it, especially if you're taking successive samples uh, and looking at the trend lines of what the nutrients are and then being, being cognizant of what the peak nutrient demands are for each crop growth stage. You can really pay attention to the right nutrient at the right time and then make sure that the, the plant's getting in the right quantity. So that's that's what allows you to use this as more of a, a, a little bit more of a proactive tool rather than being reactive and kind of being behind the curve. Okay. Yeah, and then got a question here from uh, Stephen. Um, 
should we be making an extract and spraying it on the seeds or is the inoculant that you know we at green cover are, are putting on the seed is that sufficient so maybe is can you get too much on there or is is, is there going to be any different effects um yeah as long as you know what the characteristics of the material you're putting on i'm always in favor of greater greater populations and greater diversity so if you have, uh, say, your own compost tea or something that you're doing, uh, I think that definitely would complement everything that I was talking about. Okay. Um, so our, and the, then the, and your, uh, your products, do, where do those microbes come from? Do they come from California? And maybe would, would microbes from your own farm ground be be better suited for your, you know, whoever, wherever your context is, wherever you're located? Yeah, that, that's a great, great question, because uh, there, there's a lot of perception around that. So a um, couple, couple aspects to it. One is that we, our microbes come from several, a bunch of different sources. Uh, we use uh, earthworm cultures and, uh, and some various mother cultures that we've, we've constructed by collecting biological and soil samples from literally all over the world. Uh, so we've, we've collected uh, biology in 17 different, you know, distinct different kind of biological uh, conditions. And so then we continue to nurture and propagate those over time. And so we've, we've really built up some unique biologies. So in addition to the earthworms, we also have uh, another set of biology that comes from a different trophic level of of animal on the soil, which brings an entirely different set of biology and it's very complementary. So one, our diversity in our product is I think second, second to none out there. Uh, but then the other way that I would respond to the question is all biology is everywhere all the time. Uh, the only thing that varies is the population size uh, and, its rep and its kind of representation of the population. Because with a, a single particle of dust, you can have thousands of microbes on it. And if you have a dust devil or something like that that picks up a bunch of dust, the dust gets up in the air stream, uh, in the jet stream. Literally, that particle of dust can be anywhere in the world in three days. And then as it falls out of the jet stream, you can think of it as we have this constant rain of these dust particles that are from all over the world and are raining down around us. So, uh, the, the biology in the soil you know, on your farm may be unique uh, to your conditions based off of the combinations of, of history of, of what's happened to it, but the biology is not unique to anywhere else. Okay, okay, very good. I guess I, I would say one thing about biology and, and fitness that uh, lab-raised microbes are much less fit and uh, successful at, at colonizing in the soil and performing their identified beneficial function than a community-raised microbe. So if somebody's got a compost tea or something like that, you may have the same microbes in that, or some of them, maybe the same as, as what's on some uh, you know, microbe inoculant label. But the ones that are grown as a large culture, uh, I think are going to be much more suited, much much more likely to successfully colonize and much more likely to do their beneficial function than something that's been raised in a lab in a petri dish in, in isolation from like all other species. Okay, okay, very good. Um, what, uh, what, makes your, what makes your products uh, so shell stable? And is that, is that just you know, in the jug or how does that relate to being on the shelf or even being on the seed? Um, you know, what makes them stable kind of the, you know, what's the lifespan of, of those? Sure, yeah, great question. So uh, microbes are survivors uh, and uh, there's quite a number of them that have the ability to kind of sequester themselves when conditions aren't conducive to them. So if there's no food or the pH is wrong or, or there's a toxicity or something like that, there's quite a number of the different species that have the ability to, to go into different forms of, of hibernation. So there's, I believe, at least four different ways that a microbe can either stop or substantially reduce its level of respiration. 
And then at that point, they become extremely durable. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, how durable they can be uh, in a, a core that they took out of a, a sea bottom uh, into a strata that they knew had been geologically isolated for 23 million years, they were able to pull up uh, microbes. And as soon as those microbes had suitable habitat and food, et cetera, they woke up after 23 million years. So microbes are survivors and they're extremely durable and they're opportunists because as soon as there is food and habitat, they wake up. Not all uh, microbes have that ability, but, but a lot of them do. So would that be, would that make sense then why it, it may be a conventional system of, of high synthetic use, um, high purpose, or, you know, whether synthetic chemicals or fertilizer, it, the microbes are still there. Maybe they're just, they went dormant because of, of those products being used with that? Some, yeah, sometimes that's the case. Uh, if you had a, a sublethal application of, say, uh, a fungicide. So the, the fungi might be in a spore form, which might not be vulnerable to that level of, of toxicity. So yeah, you're right. It would just sit there and wait it out until the, the level was something that it can tolerate it and it come right back out. OK, OK, very good. Uh, yeah, I guess that kind of uh, maybe works into this question um, uh, from Lisa. How do seed treatments, especially fungus fungicides, interfere with microbe colonization and germination? How many days of growth until that seed treatment is diluted with root growth and colonization can then occur? Well, good question, uh, and that is so so challenging uh, that I know that so many seeds are, it's hard, hard to even find naked seeds that haven't been you know, coated with some sort of fungicide. And, and you're right, it is very counterproductive to us getting that seed colonized. So if you don't have a, if you don't have a known uh, high infectious pressure of a particular pathogen you're trying to address by having that fungicide seed coat, if you can avoid it, don't do it because all you're doing is you're suppressing the biology and its ability to, to assist the plant. And as to how long that lasts, I don't know that that's, a, that's not really an answerable question, I don't think. It's gonna be so situational. Depends on the soil type and uh, moisture content and maybe temperature, uh, and even the, the community of microbes that are, are there to potentially colonize. Some will have a lot, actually some won't be bothered at all, by it and they might be able to colonize right away other other ones will will never colonize it okay uh yeah then um i think that that transitions us into our next question here um how does air temperature impact if, if, uh, efficiency in is there a minimum air or soil temperature for these biologicals or microbes in general that uh and maybe even on the maximum end of that too yeah, there's uh, microbes, their metabolism is, is definitely affected by temperature. So as it gets colder, their metabolism slow down. So they're, they're doing less. Uh, they'll consume less food, they'll produce less metabolites, they'll be less active. Um, we, we certainly pay a lot of uh, attention to the temperature ranges in which we propagate our, our biology because we do think it it can affect actually the composition of the community. But microbes, there's a lot of microbes that will be reasonably active all the way down to say 45 degrees. Uh, and of course you can freeze them and you don't really lose population, but they certainly become very, very slow at that point. And then on the upper end of the scale, uh, certainly we won't propagate uh, microbes above about 80 degrees because again, it changes the population. If you're applying them, I'd say it's a lot less sensitive to that, especially if you're putting it through irrigation. Uh, I wouldn't say there's any upper end temperature cutoff for irrigation applied. If you're fully applying, I definitely don't like to fully apply anything above about 90 degrees. Okay. Okay. Very good. And if you if you are fully applying microbes, uh, make sure you put uh, microbes on with food. Uh, so either one of our 
uh, wettable powder foods or fish, uh, but and also something that creates additional habitat and UV cover. So uh, either usually for UV cover, uh, a humic of some sort. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we got a question here from Gene. Uh, what percentage of the plant nutrition comes from the rhiz rhizophagy cycle, uh, the oxidization of the microbe shell and stripping out of the nutrients? I don't, I, I certainly don't think anybody has that answer. Um, you know, so there, I, I had the picture of the, the microbes going into the, the root hair uh, and that whole process. I, I don't think that's been documented. Even, even the process has been documented for say more than about five years. Uh, and in terms of quantifying it, I think it would be different depending on the biology and on the, and even as much as the variety of, of the, the plant, uh, even more, even as much as the species. So as I mentioned, say the GMO uh, plant might be much less uh, conducive to that relationship than say some other species of plant. Then, then the other type of uh, microbe feeding of the nutrients is those endophytes that I was talking about. So the, the fungi that colonize partially inside the roots so that you know, they're actually part of the vascular system of the plant at that point. And so gathering uh, nutrients and transporting them through those hyphae and then delivering them directly to the root. So there's two very different kind of modes of, of delivering of nutrients. And I couldn't even hazard a guess as to the relative proportions uh, between those. I, I guess you'd be, it'd be much more likely that the bacterial uh, function on that root, root hair would be the thing that you probably see the most commonly and less commonly the, the fungal uh, relationship, mostly because there's not that many product, production ag soils that successfully have that, that fungal uh, representation. Okay. <clears throat> I believe we have a, a YouTube video um, with, uh, I think it's Dr. James White that, we, that he talks about um, the rhizophagy cycle. So maybe there's some, some more information um, that, that um, you, you can get out of out of that video as well. Um, I, I love that video. It, that's, I mean, it's so illustrative of it. They, they've done such great work there, and and that's that's what I'm describing is is their work. Okay, um, got a question here from Chad. Um, how does uh, electric conductivity of the soil affect microbial population or inoculation? Is there any? <laughs> Sure, yeah, so the electrical conductivity uh, is a common measure of uh, salts. And there are some species of microbes that are pretty salt tolerant, so, uh, and then there's ones that are, that are not. And so as you build more salts in the soil, you start to lose some component of the biology. So kind of, you know, of that Venn diagram that I was showing is basically gonna be shrinking. And so there, there, there are some species that are very, very salt tolerant and ones that are not. Okay, so yeah, that would probably go along with, you know, some of the reduction of fertility with the high salt nitrogen or phosphorus products as well. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll, t I'll t take that as an opportunity to, to say something that if, uh, so the, the synthetic fertilizers tend to disrupt that relationship between the, the plant and the biology where the, the plant is feeding the, the microbes, uh, sugars and signalers to collect uh, nutrients for it. Because if you're already putting fertilizer, you know, synthetic fertilizers on an ionic form, the plant doesn't really have the motivation to invest energy in feeding the microbes. Uh, but as long as you're not using uh, Prilled or you know particulate solid type fertilizers, those those I definitely have a, a prefer if our growers uh, can find ways to migrate away from those products because every one of those little particles when it lands on the soil is basically this little salt ball, and so you've got this gradient from right next to it that almost none of the microbes can tolerate because it just would be uh, would. Uh, dehydrate them, just literally through osmotic pressure, just pull the liquids right through the, their membranes. And then as you go away from that in distance, you can see more and more biology being able to, to tolerate that, that little salt bomb. 
So to the ex extent that we can use liquid fertilizers instead of those uh, particulate ones, we can do ourselves, even without, without changing anything else, we can do ourselves a lot of favor in, in terms of the condition for our biology in the soil. Okay, cool. Um, got a question here from Jim. Uh, do protozoa and nematodes populate as well with your, with your products? There are some protozoa in uh, some of our products. Um, those would be the uh, intestate amoeba and the uh, flagellates. Uh, very few, uh, if any, ciliates and no uh, free form amoeba. Uh, those are really the recyclers in the soil. Uh, and those, those typically will be pretty well represented in the soil. And as soon as you build the, the rest of the biology, you've created the food source for the protozoa. So those should re really reestablish themselves pretty, pretty easily. And then in terms of nematodes, we do have one product that has uh, nematodes in, in it. And of course they do a lot of important uh, nutrient cycling and, and cleanup work in the soil as well. Okay. Um, another question here, uh, when applying, uh, the, the products to like the, the residue products, um, is whether a factor in success of those products breaking down that residue? Yeah. Again, the metabolism is somewhat dictated by, by temperatures, but the decomposers, uh, do pretty well in cooler temperatures. And that's one of the reasons why, if you looked at that part of the crop program, the example one there, uh, that there's a little bit of fish on there with them, and that, and as well as food, and what it's doing is kind of giving a jump start of the population to really get deep into those tissues, uh, and have a, a reasonable carbon to nitrogen ratio to get the population roll. Uh, so that'll that'll sustain a higher level act of activity through the winter. Okay. I think we have a few more questions here, so we'll we'll continue on if that works for you, David. Sure. Uh, so is there a good way to test the microbes that are on the seed and how much will <clears throat> how much will seed grown in a regenerative system be than seed grown in a conventional system? You know, the microbial difference maybe there. Okay, I'll I'll tackle the first part and then maybe we can talk our way through the second one. So if we wanted to quantify and characterize the biology that's on a seed, we could actually uh, do, uh, probably take an untreated seed or some seeds and then take some treated seeds and then send them through uh, metagenomics. So if you're not familiar with metagenomics, it's a, it's a lab technique that they use to uh, strip the DNA out of the microbes and uh, separate out the viable uh, DNA from the non-viable DNA. So you know which ones are actually you know, living, living biology. Then they sequence that DNA. So create this really long string of you know, all, all of the DNA. They pattern match that to a database. And then you can, uh, if you get a match, you can name you know, what's the name of this microbe and what does it do? Uh, there's processes you can also do that are quantitative enumeration. So you can actually get a population. So if we wanted to say, what's colonized on this, you know, uh, on the seed treatment, and then how much of it is there? Uh, we do actually have a tool that would do that. And actually, I think you probably would be able to get the endogenous uh, microbe species as well. So those ones that are on the inside of the, the seed, which would be pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, and then the, the, I think the second part to this question, or maybe it's a separate question, um, how much better will a seed grown in a regenerative system be than a seed grown in a conventional system is how. Um, yeah, I, I guess in general, I would say my expectation would be that if you have a regenerative system where we built up all this complementary biology, you have so much more opportunity for things to go well. Uh, you know, you should have better soil physical and chemical characteristics. You should have more supportive biology and more of it. Uh, than a conventional system. So for all those reasons, I would have high expectations for the regenerative uh, set of conditions to be much more favorable for the crop. Okay. Uh, I think we have, have one last question here that we'll take. Uh, what type of soil test was used to get all the results that you showed on the treated versus untreated in the soil case study? 
yeah, the, the restoring. Uh, actually, that was metagenomics. So we took some soil uh, that was untreated versus the treated soil, sent both of those in for metagenomics. And again, uh, it gave us a quantitative enumeration in all the species. And then from there, we kind of broke it down as to what their functions were. Okay. Very good. Well, David, thank you for uh, you give, giving us your time for today to uh, you know, enlighten us on, on more into this uh, you know, microbial biological uh, process in the soil and, and also on some of the products that you you carry. Um, and I want to thank everybody else for attending today. Um, this will be again recorded and, and put on our YouTube page. Uh, next week, uh, Wednesday at the same time, we will have um, uh, Scott Scheimer and, uh, and some of the Elevate Ag team talking about um, the Hypergrow product and what they've seen on, uh, I believe, Scott's farm. So join us next week. And again, David, thank you. And um, everybody have a great day. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it.